In this final video in our three-part series on influenza, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the epidemiology and what we can do as a society from a public health perspective to protect ourselves and to, um, to treat influenza if and when it happens. Now, at the end of the last video, we talked about RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and how RNA polymerases don't have a proofreading activity the way that DNA polymerases do. DNA viruses, therefore, uh, do not drift around genetically uh, nearly to the extent that RNA viruses do. And what do I mean by genetically drift? Uh, with each round of a, an RNA polymerase creating new RNA molecules, there's the potential for uh, introducing errors into the sequence. Those errors in the nucleotide sequence of each of those, those eight segments can translate into, literally translate into, errors in the amino acid sequence of the resulting protein. So not only does the resulting protein behave a little bit differently, but it will actually look a little bit different to our immune system. Now we haven't talked about the immune system yet, but at the heart of the immune system is this principle of distinguishing self from non-self. And we have something called immunological memory, where we have cells and molecules that take essentially a snapshot at the molecular level of pathogens that they've seen before. Now, they don't take a picture of the entire pathogen. They take a picture of a molecule that's exposed on that pathogen. And in fact, they don't just take a picture of, of a molecule on that pathogen. They take a picture of a tiny little fragment of a molecule on a pathogen. That's called an epitope. Now, if that epitope happens to be where there's been a genetic change due to the high mutation rate of RNA polymerase, all of a sudden it looks a little different, and it's not going to be recognized by our, our immunological memory. This we call antigenic drift because the antigen, the surface antigens, what were the surface antigens called? Do you remember? Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. When there are changes in the RNA sequence, for hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that lead to changes in the protein sequence for those two proteins. All of a sudden, the immunological memory that, that we've stored from our last exposure, either an exposure through illness or an exposure through vaccine, is no longer valid. And we're vulnerable to that new version, that new look. It's basically a way of constantly changing its look so that uh, we're constantly on our toes. Antigenic drift, mutations in genes coding for hemagglutinin or neuraminidase due to the high error rate of RNA polymerase. This is why we need a new influenza vaccine year after year. Because the influenza that we see this year, be it live or in vaccine form, is not going to be exactly the same as the influenza that we see next year. That's the, the idea behind it. Okay, now there's a related idea called antigenic shift. Now, antigenic drift, think of drift as being a slow, moderate, uh, lazy kind of change. A little RNA change here, RNA change there, accumulating over time. Antigenic shift is more abrupt. <clears throat> Here's the idea. It turns out that influenza viruses, multiple influenza viruses, can co-infect the same cell at the same time. Probably doesn't happen very often just by, by the odds, but doesn't have to happen very often. Now imagine if the two influenza viruses there had decided, so to speak, to co-infect, uh, let's say, one of your respiratory epithelial cells, <clears throat> are two different influenza viruses. There are two different versions. Maybe one is H1N1 and the other is H3N2. When they co-infect, both of their genomes get replicated into lots and lots of copies in the biosynthesis phase and lots of new proteins are made in the biosynthesis phase. And then in the assembly phase, you start getting packaging. And the packaging is not so specific as to be able to distinguish whose chromosomes belong with whom. And what you end up with is a reshuffling. Okay, this is sometimes called a gene reassortment. So these eight fragments of RNA that encode eight different genes 
um, for the influenza variant can actually get shuffled together. So in the new variants that come out, maybe you've got a couple genes from the H1N1, but a couple genes mixed in from the H2N3 to have a full set of all eight. So you still have chromosomes one through eight, but they're coming from two different sources. Now under a lot most conditions, probably that's not going to make a difference, but under some conditions, you're going to reassort and get an entirely new virus that's going to look completely different from anything our immune system is seeing, and it may be more or potentially less virulent. So for example, <clears throat> maybe you've got a strain that transmits between people very aggressively, but it causes very mild disease. And it co-infects a cell with a strain that doesn't transfer very well between people, but causes very aggressive, highly virulent disease you run the risk of a new variant emerging from that cell that has the worst properties of both. Highly contagious and highly virulent. Okay, You see at the bottom it says antigenic shift can take place in humans, but it can also take place in other reservoirs. And the other primary reservoirs, believe it or not, are pigs and water birds, like geese and ducks. So when they're not in us, they're cruising around in these animals, either causing um, mild infection or no infection at all. They get a lot of the reassortment, the antigenic shift that takes place, seems to be taking place in these, um, these non-human reservoirs. So think through the difference between antigenic shift and antigenic drift. Make sure you understand them and you understand how shift can lead to a whole new novel, potentially highly dangerous strain. Whereas drift is not likely to sneak up on us so fast, but it does keep us on our toes from one season to the next. All right, what about the epidemiology? I want to get some terms under our belt here. Seasonal flu, this is the common human disease. Most of us actually have some low-level immunity because we've been exposed at some level. So even though antigenic drift is always happening, we may have snapshots of other angles, of other portions of the antigens on the surface that may provide some sort of immunity. So most of us have some level of, of immunity. And there are, in fact, vaccines available, as most of you know. And those vaccines have to be altered and changed from year to year. And so what happens is the CDC here in, in America watches the types of influenza strains circulating around the world and tries to predict which ones it looks like are going to land here in the United States. And then they have a couple of months to scramble and put vaccines together that represent the two or three or maybe four most likely scenarios, the most likely versions of influenza that are going to hit us. Nine out of ten years, they nail it, they get it right, it's highly effective. Every now and then it's a different strain that hits us, one that we didn't see, and it's a lot less effective. Can't blame the CDC for that, they're doing the best they can. You know, working it with global data sets can't be easy. And with seasonal flu, the symptoms, well, we'll say they're mild. If you've ever had the flu, you know they're, they're horrible, you wish you were dead at times, it's just, it's miserable. But <clears throat> Typically, they're rarely life-threatening unless you are in a high-risk group like we talked about before. You might be miserable for a week to 10 days, um, but you're not likely to have major complications, and you're not likely to, um, to see your life being at risk with seasonal flu. Now, bird flu or avian flu is a different story. These are strains of influenza A that typically are infecting birds, and these birds may or may not show any symptoms. They very rarely jump from bird to human, and they have not, re not definitively been shown to jump from human to human once they do hit a person. <clears throat> when they do get into people, though, the mortality rate is like 30, uh, 66%. Your survival rate is about 33%. So you don't have much of a chance of surviving if you do pick up avian flu. About two out of three people that get it die from it. Um, it lacks a, a, a strong ability to transfer from person to person. There have been some cases within a family where multiple people in the family got it. It's been speculated that it transferred from human to human. But these are families that work on farms with birds. And they work around bird fluids, bird blood, bird feces, bird urine, bird mucus, bird saliva. And so <clears throat> the question still remains, did dad get it from a bird? and then give it to the kids? Or did dad get it from bird and the kids also got it from birds because they're all exposed to these birds at the same time? So there's still some reason to doubt that it can transmit from person to person. 
Avian influenza is one of those areas where an antigenic shift could be really scary, where we mix the high virulence of avian flu strains with the high transmissibility of seasonal flu strains in something like a bird or a pig or potentially a human. And we release um, a new reassorted uh, version of the virus that is much more dangerous. And that's, that's on a lot of people's radar. And the CDC and other epidemiology, public health type organizations are watching for that very, very carefully. Then we've got this term pandemic flu. Uh, for a long time, the term pandemic flu was being jumbled up with the term avian flu. But you need to understand these are two different things. Pandemic flu simply means a global outbreak due to either a new strain or a highly virulent strain. So either something that's arisen through, through um, antigenic shift or something that's been out there for a while that we just haven't seen. It hasn't found its way into the human population, at least not for, for several generations. Pandemic means that it's going to be a global outbreak. <clears throat> it could be a global outbreak of a mild strain or it could be a global outbreak of a very uh, virulent strain. The influenza pandemic of 1918 was, was famous, where it was uh, highly virulent, uh, highly transmissible, and it was a global outbreak. The estimates are that about 50% of the entire world was positively infected, and that there were about 50 million deaths. Now, there's good news and bad news here that I want to follow this up with. Bad news is that epidemiologists tell us that global influenza pandemics occur roughly once every 100 years. We haven't truly had a pandemic, uh, not of this scale, since 1918. So some people want to say that um, that we're due, right? This is 2016 at the time that I'm recording this, and so we're at 98 years. Some people would argue that we're due. Now, that's the bad news. The good news, though, is that the world of healthcare in 1918 is completely different from the world of healthcare in 2016. Uh, we understand influenza so much better. We understand vaccinations so much better. We have uh, surveillance systems globally that can keep an eye on these things. And we're in a position to respond and treat uh, in ways that we never could have dreamed of in 1918. So even if and when this new strain emerges that could potentially hit us and have the potential at least to spread across the world, and cause tens of millions of deaths. Um, many people, myself included, believe that our healthcare system is so much more robust today that, um, that we'll be able to keep this in check if and when it does happen. We can always hope and pray, right? <clears throat> so what's required for a flu pandemic? Well, it needs to be a new virus to which there is little or no immunity. This can arise by mutation, antigenic drift, but more likely it's going to happen by antigenic shift, or a gene reassortment. We just spent some time talking about that. Number two, it has to cause illness in humans when it's transmitted from whatever the reservoir is. If it gets into us, it doesn't matter if it's new. If it gets into us and doesn't cause any disease, we're not going to worry about it, right? It can spread all at once, too, if it's not making anybody sick. Number three, it has to be efficiently transmitted from human to human. Some of the most virulent strains do not transmit from human to human. They transmit from reservoir to human. Maybe it's a duck, a chicken, or a pig to human. But they typically do not transmit all that well from human to human. And number three there, of course, is the big fear with something like bird flu and the potential for, for a, a gene reassortment, right? an antigenic shift to take place where we've already fulfilled requirements one and two, and all of a sudden three gets added in with a completely different organism uh, that was uh, reshuffled into the, into the genetic card deck, so to speak. Some fun facts about seasonal flu. About half of all infections are asymptomatic, which means if you've gotten it twice in your life, then you were probably infected four times on average. Something called the basic reproduction number tells us for every one person who is infected and actively sick, they will share it with how many others? So the basic reproduction number for the flu is 1.5. That means that if I'm sick with influenza, I will likely give it to one and a half other people. I'm not going to give it to a half person, but it means for every two of us that are sick with influenza, we're likely to pass it on to three others. So you can see how quickly that can uh, get out of control, right? So for um, 50 people with influenza, they're going to pass it off to 150 others. Very, very rapid spread. Uh, basic reproduction number of 1.5 is quite high. Uh, 
It's transmitted, we believe, by respiratory droplets through coughing and sneezing, primarily inhaled through the nose, but it can also be picked up by something called fomites. Fomites are um, abiotic, inanimate surfaces where a microbe can stick around for a while. So a door handle. One person, let's say your roommate has the flu, she sneezes on her hand then opens the dorm door and then you grab the door and a few minutes later you get an itch on your nose and you rub it, all of a sudden you're infected with influenza. Um, maybe you accidentally used somebody's toothbrush. That would be a fomite as well. So respiratory droplets seem to be involved, coughing and sneezing in particular, but fomites may also play an important role. And then as we mentioned before, aquatic birds and pigs are the primary non-human reservoirs as far as we can tell. <clears throat> Let's finish with the idea of treatment or prevention. This is a vaccine preventable disease. Um, do our public health officials always get it right? No. Um, but um, they get it right far more often than they get it wrong, and the risks of not being vaccinated far outweigh the risks of being vaccinated. The, the robust statistics back that up. Vaccination is artificially acquired immunity. It's building up that immunological memory we talked about without having to experience illness the first time. We'll talk more about vaccines uh, at the end of the semester when we talk about the immune system. We have two categories of anti-influenza drugs. Once someone is infected with influenza, we can use amantadine or rimantadine. These are uh, viral replication inhibitors. They stop the virus once it's gotten in from uncoding and replicating. But we've had high resistance rates. You can see in this slide I say have led to, led to CDC recommendations that these not be used for at least the past six flu seasons. We are now up to seven consecutive flu seasons. Um, where amantadine and rimantadine are not recommended because of high resistance rates. Uh, the category that is still functioning well are neuraminidase inhibitors, zanamivir and oseltamivir. Right? If, if we can knock out neuraminidase, we can knock out their ability to spread. So there may be some initial infection, but we can stop the infection very, very quickly. You've heard of Tamiflu, lots of commercials these days for Tamiflu. Tamiflu is one of these neuraminidase inhibitors knocks out neuraminidase and knocks out the spread of the viruses. So why aren't we all taking it? Well, we don't want zanamivir and oseltamivir to go the way of amantadine and rimantadine, where resistance rates are so high that we can't risk somebody's life. We can't um, risk their treatment on a particular drug that maybe has a you know a 25 or 50 percent resistance rate. So if we can not overuse these drugs and really limit them for people that are at risk, at high risk, those high-risk groups we talked about in, in video number one, um, then we can hopefully slow and delay the onset of resistance to these drugs and maintain their, their shelf life, so to speak, for as long as possible. Hope this was helpful. Hope this was interesting. And uh, look forward to talking to you guys about this soon.